Welcome to Insights, the podcast of Forerunners of America. And we are here to warn the nation from a biblical perspective and to help you respond in faith. And today we're looking at what can we be thankful for in 2022. At first, I didn't think there were going to be this many significant things and highlights, but there are. And to help me unpack this today, uh, back with us uh, at Insights is Dave Brody, zooming in from the Middle East. Welcome back, Dave. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you. And Dave, we go all the way back to college, and you were our go-to guy, not just for me, but for many people uh, in, in the Christian ministry we were a part of. You are a go-to guy on these very topics that we talk about on these Insights podcasts. So here we are, all these years later, and you're still my go-to guy. So thank you for being a part of this. And um, and also just want to be clarify for everybody that uh, that Dave, this is not a joke. Dave is actually one of the only people I know that didn't have a, like a large poster of some model like Fair Fawcett or something up on, on his dorm room wall. He actually had a large poster of Margaret Thatcher. So anyway, Dave, you've never changed course. You've always been interested in these topics. And I'm, again, grateful to, to have you. Yeah, thank you. So we're looking at what can we be thankful for in 2022? And I want to just give us a little bit of a summary as I think where we're going to go in this conversation. And there's just some some godless narratives that are falling apart, which means righteousness is going forth. And it's happening in some, some surprising ways, actually, that we're going to get into here shortly. But some of these godless narratives, uh, one would be LGBTQ narrative, the other one that there was a constitutional protection of the right to abortion uh, that we'll talk about here that was obviously significant this last summer related to the Supreme Court's decision. And then also uh, the narratives of COVID. There's some things here that we'll see actually were godless. And I think it's coming to light more and more here, especially this last year, as well as I believe that believers are waking up. Christians are doing more to be salt and light in the culture, which is what Jesus has always called his people to do. And so that's just a quick summary of what I'm hoping um, our podcast uh, uh, covers. And and obviously, we're just uh, going to be able to give things a, sort of a, a flyover and not get too deep, but I hope we can drill down a little bit. And so, Dave, with that said, let's take a look at this first area that the narrative of LGBTQ, yes, it's surging. We even did a podcast on surging transgenderism this last spring. It was number 181. If people want to look at that, we I interviewed Stephen Black, uh, who came out of that life, lifestyle himself. And then he, um, he has been part of ministry now for decades and doing a great job. Um, but we do see surging transgenderism in other things, but also there's some really amazing things that have happened uh, in terms of uh, hopefulness and turning a corner here that that while we're getting some traction in responding to LGBTQ. And Dave, have you sensed that or do you feel that as well? Yeah, I, I sense there is more of a a uh, yeah, kind of a uh, fight back of not just allowing things to flow in that direction. Sure. And so one of the things that really caught my attention, again, from 2022 is on March 12th, there was something called D-Trans Awareness Day. And you can go to hashtag D-Trans Awareness Day and all of these testimonies are there. And I'm just going to read a couple if we can get the pictures of these young people, both uh, when they transition and after they transition, how happy they are, are meaning when they detransition. Let's get that up on the screen. I want to also read some of the, the testimonies that we'll put up as well. And so this first one is from a gal named Helena. And she says this, when I was 15, lonely and hated my body, I got sucked into gender ideology online. My school encouraged me and I was easily prescribed a high dose of testosterone at 18. And it was very damaging. And so she goes on from there to give her fuller testimony of why she detransitioned, alerting people it's often a big mistake. This next one's from somebody named Grace, and she says this is on the left, and we have this up on the screen for those that are getting this at YouTube and Rumble. Uh, this is me shortly after top surgery 2017, so breast removal 2017. This was the darkest time in my life on the right is me recently. Life goes on and life gets better. 
Here's another one. This one is from Frau Lumi from Finland. And she says, this is me on the left in 2019 and me today on the right. I feel like back in the day, I was not but a caricature of myself, depressed, unhappy, non-functioning and suicidal. And there you can see that she's on the right. And she says, my smile now is genuine. Back then it was acted. And one, and one last one, Jesse says, the LGBT community online brainwashed me into thinking my confusion and pain was gender dysphoria when I was 16 to 18 years old, is what she says. I am so grateful I only socially transition. At 24, I am happy, thriving, feminine. I love being a woman and was never anything else. I mean, I don't even know where these people are with uh, faith or lack of faith, but they're saying the truth, whether they realize it or not, that God created us, as the scriptures say, male or female. And I hope that this D-Trans Awareness Day only grows this coming year. It's just such an amazing thing to hear these testimonies. And Dave, I don't know if you have anything else to say on that or um, Dave, have you heard um, about gays against grooming, meaning there's a grooming narrative out there, a grooming uh, vibe out there related to grooming what would be straight people or um, or uh, cisgender people. It would be to groom them for LGBTQ lifestyles. But there's this, this organization called Gays Against Groomers, or it's at least a hashtag you can go to, Gays Against Groomers. Have you heard of, of that? I have not, but it sounds like it's a good initiative. Right. I mean, again, it brings a lot of hope, I think, uh, again, for the Christian message. And this is what's surprising about this, is that this is not coming uh, necessarily, uh, usually, I would say, from Christians or people that are attending church. These are people that are standing up against the grooming of our children, um, even within the public schools, standing up against that, even as gay people themselves. And let's play a clip right now. This is a school board meeting. Let's listen to this, this self-identified gay man explain why he's so upset with the public schools and the school board. Let's play that now. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here today because I am concerned about the current and future state of our education system. I'm a Miami native and a product of the MDCPS system. I'm also a gay man, and as a gay man, I understand the importance of a healthy and balanced education. I understand the importance in diversity of thought, and ultimately, I understand the importance of unbiased development. What is happening right now is no longer acceptance. It's no longer the support my community needed in the 90s and early 2000s. It's indoctrination. I do not use the word lightly, but it's the truth. The children deserve an education that will develop them, give them a platform for critical thinking and problem solving so that we can push and create a better future. What we are pushing right now is not that. We are moving in a direction that will create entitled, confused, depressed, and potentially dangerous adults. Providing support and being accepting is very different from promoting and encouraging a certain lifestyle. Parents must be in 100% control of their child's development and education. The education system the education system has been hijacked by people who push their agendas disguised as social justice warriors. I am gay. I am not oppressed. I am not being attacked. I'm not abused. Please treat me the same as everyone else. I remember when we were fighting to be equal, and now we're fighting to have an entire month celebrating my sexuality and parades. I don't need that. So as these voices get louder, more prominent, uh, their videos and message passed around, this really is helpful to us as Christians to want to help present uh, that that it's not okay. It's not okay. And even gays themselves are saying it's not okay to be grooming the next generation for something they would never naturally choose. Um, so uh, moving right along here, um, there's also some encouraging news related to, to what's going on with Disney, the Disney Corporation. And um, Dave, have you followed that at all? Yeah, well, I had heard about... Uh the the backlash to what they to disney so that's been good i do want to drill down on that a little bit because uh christopher rufo who i have uh quoted a number of times on various podcasts um i want to read from a, a speech that he gave at hillsdale college and so this would have been last spring again in 2022 all of these good things are happening and uh he's explaining what was going on with Disney. It's quite eye-opening. Now, again, Christopher Rufo, he's an investigative reporter. He's a journalist. He's put 
together uh, films, documentaries, these kinds of things. And he's really gotten traction, as you'll see here in a moment. So uh, for those that are getting the, the video version of this, we will put the, the words up on the screen as I go here, because it's rather lengthy, but it's very helpful. And his article that I'm reading from is called Laying Siege to Institutions. And he talks about how the ideology of the 1960s has just simply gone through the institutions. It hasn't gone away since the 1960s. And we're, that's why we're confronting so many ideological issues. Well, he gets later in... This uh, this article to the don't say gay bill. That's not the real name of it, but we might remember this um, being advanced in Florida, and the the pro LGBTQ crowd called it don't say gay bill. And since that's how it's best known, we'll just go with that here as the as the article does. But there's quite a brouhaha in Florida where Disney World is, of course, and this is what Christopher Rufo says. Depending on the questions used by the pollsters, between 60 and 80 percent of Floridians did not want the LGBTQ uh, narrative and ideology to be advanced in their state. And Rufo goes on to say, acting against its own apparent business interests, Disney, the most famous children's entertainment corporation in history, came out publicly in opposition to this bill, which banned discussions of gender identity in, in elementary classrooms prior to the fourth grade. So we're talking about here K through third grade. They're just trying to ban it at these super young, impressionable minds. Now, my personal opinion is I think it should be banned K through 12. And let's let this get discussed between adults and college and universities and so forth, or, or, or wherever you are as an adult, but let's not do this to kids. It goes on to say, in an official statement by Disney, it declared that the company's goals, goal was, quote, for this law to be repealed or struck down in the courts. Rufo continues, shortly thereafter, my sources at Disney leaked a video to me of an hour and 40 minute company wide meeting about the controversy. And what did the video reveal? In a series of unedited clips that I released on social media, an executive producer at Disney said that she had been inserting what she called, quote, a not-so-secret gay agenda into children's programming, targeting kids as young as two years old and, and had experienced no pushback. Well, then it, the uh, Rufo goes on to... Uh, to share in his speech about the fallout for Disney. And it says this, and by the way, that these um, these leaked videos got 100 million impressions out there on social media and it caught a lot of people's attention. And it, he explains what happened to Disney. With public opinion heavily on the other side, not only in Florida, but nationwide, Disney was pummeled. People started canceling their subscriptions to Disney's streaming service, canceling planned trips to Disney theme parks, canceling Disney cruises, and thinking twice about allowing their children to watch Disney movies. Elected officials noticed, too, the Florida legislature and Governor DeSantis have already revoked the special governance and tax status Disney has enjoyed since the 1960s. Disney's stock value plummeted nearly $50 billion in less than two months. And so on the one hand, I'm thinking, what kind of world do we live in where we actually have to protect our own children from Disney of all things? I grew up uh, as a family. We went to Disney World when I was growing up. It's like, this is the world we live in. It actually is. There's ideologues leading Disney World that, um, that needed to be uh, challenged and actually defeated on many things. But this is so encouraging, Dave, that all these things are happening in 2022. And if you can take an iconic enterprise industry like the Disney Corporation and essentially uh, ca cause them to go reeling, like we should be very encouraged because this is, means that the 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 bandwidth for biblical truth, for people not to get swept up in LGBTQ, D TQ. It's all more of a cultural force. Yeah, it seems like in the past, we we conservatives and we Christians would just wring our hands at all the stuff Disney was doing. And it's so good to see that there is, you know, a strategic fighting back of this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I, I like this quote by, by Bill Maher. He said, if kids knew what they wanted to be at age eight, the world would be filled with cowboys and princesses. I wanted to be a pirate. Thank God no one took 
took, a, took me seriously and scheduled me for eye removal and peg leg surgery. Classic. <laughs> so well said. And by the way, Bill Maher, he is on the far left, at least traditionally, but it is interesting to me that even he, in the camp that seems to always be promoting LGBTQ lifestyles, even he is saying, wait a second here, especially with our kids, we need to give this a second look. Yeah, I think and I think even though he tends to be liberal at the same time, he's he's looking at how things are playing out and he's he's waking up to some things, which is encouraging. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, like classically liberalism meant that you would debate these things, you could talk within it wasn't sort of the one-dimensional messaging that we often hear. Um, from various leftist organizations, groups, et cetera, now, but it was more, and I think he's more of a classic liberal. I remember years ago when he actually stood up because they were trying to lump Muslim terrorists and Christians as the, as the same thing. And he was the one voice that stood up and said, look, look at the data. You cannot lump Christians in with terrorists. These are categorically different uh, groups of people and their belief systems lead them to different conclusions. And he was really trying uh, to go to bat for Christians. Okay, so all of this in the LGBTQ area, I hope that that, that narrative continues to collapse that we've been hearing now for so many years. Um, but at least we've got the beginnings of, of challenge, legitimate challenge to the narrative. Again, I think of Jesus wanting us to be salt and light in the culture. It's so encouraging. Um, but let's go on to a second narrative that that collapsed, and that is that the U.S. Constitution uh, protects the right of every woman to have an abortion if, if they want. So this has completely collapsed as of the end of June in 2022, when the Supreme Court, I didn't get a hint or, or any smell of that they were doing this out of some biblical convictions, but but they just focused on the Constitution. And they said, look, the Constitution of the U.S. doesn't say anything about this. So um, they kicked it back to the states. It was more of a, a constitutional, legal, procedural thing. It's not like some huge victory for, for Bible believers and seeing the biblical truth go forth. But nevertheless, it took it out of there. So now state by state, we can discuss all of this. And let's put up... Uh, again, uh, on, on the screen uh, for um, for those that are getting the, the video version of this. But this is a, a map that was put up by the Alliance Defending Freedom Organization. And it's a it's a map of abortion laws. And and uh, I'll try to explain to those, those that are on Spotify only getting the audio here or SoundCloud or wherever. But there's a, a number of red states that you have here. And these are the states that protect life, like constitutionally in their state constitutions, that when Roe v. Wade uh, would be defeated, and again, it was last summer, there or overruled, therefore, um, these are the states that have trigger laws that would protect life immediately. Then as the as you look at the map here further, you see gray states, and they, they that protects life in some circumstances in those states. And then third, you've got blue states, which um, allow late-term abortions. And so anyway, we're back to the states, uh, which is a huge step forward. All the people, I just want to give a shout out to all the people that prayed and even fasted and preached the truth on pro-life issues all these years since 1973, uh, that there are things happening. Now, yeah, we got this <laughs> huge battle in all kinds of states, but still you have now the freedom to have that battle. You're not just being overruled by uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court. So anyway, uh, uh, very encouraging. Yeah, we need to rejoice in that in that victory, and at the same time, uh, keep advancing in those states where it's undecided and still battling it, even in those states where it's very much allowed. Right, and that's a good warning um, because, um, okay, for example, I'm um, having lived in Michigan. Um, I'm very tied in and have friends there and so forth, but they had something just here on the November 8th uh, midterm election. They had Proposition 3 in Michigan. And as Timothy Zebel on our foreigner staff said, is it was so radical. And by the way, it did pass Proposition 3 in Michigan. Is so radical. He said, you have to look to a communist country like uh, like China, or you have to look to a totalitarian regime like North Korea to find as radical 
pro-abortion laws as what was just passed in Michigan. So in that map that we just had up, you have to change Michigan from a gray state to actually a blue, a blue state, meaning that there are no restrictions. And it's uh and it's pretty radical what they did. We're not going to get into the details of that. But the point is we do need to be alert. And and I'm wondering how many Christians were even aware, meaning Christians in the state of Michigan were even aware that this was on the ballot, and um, and some that stayed at home maybe needed to get to the the polling booth to uh, to help stop this. Unfortunately, it didn't stop. So we do need to be to be vigilant. Okay, another cultural narrative that has been shifting in 2022, and uh, I'm hoping will completely collapse. But I'm grateful for the advancing of good messaging and truth that's happened in 22, and that's stuff related to COVID. And this fear narrative, when you think about where we were a year ago and where we're at right now, it's amazing how people are are living their lives or um, we've moved on to a large degree. I know that um, that recently the, the the U.S. Senate, the, the 62 senators, so uh, definitely both uh, it was bipartisan, that voted to stop the emergency um, authorization that the, the President Biden has. And I, I that's not exactly a done deal. A done deal yet, but we're seeing a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that are ready to move on. And as many have said, to like the flu, uh, you know, we're going to learn to live with it instead of trying to um, live without it, which is not obviously a reality. And um, Dave, I was reminded uh, just here in the last few weeks, a good friend of mine who's a nurse and he's been in different hospitals over his career, but he just applied for. A new job, and he specifically asked them about the COVID restrictions in that hospital because that's you know uh, frontline workers, and and the vaccine is often mandated, and just other restrictions and mandates and so forth. And the hospital little, literally said this to him: "They said we have moved on from COVID, not not meaning that they're not treating people and helping people. Of course they are, but it's that this idea again that we're learning to live with it and we're functioning without these blanket mandates." Yeah, and, and uh, also what, uh, an encouraging aspect was the Supreme Court came against some of this nonsense, like unelected bureaucrats putting out a uh, eviction moratorium during COVID. You know, they they ruled against that. They also ruled against you know re- the unelected bureaucrats requiring all these workers to get the vaccine. Right. Wow. I mean, um, it's very interesting as things even legally, like you're saying, get played out that really the COVID narrative was a huge uh, overreach in many, many areas that, that yes. in my opinion, should not have happened. And like you're saying, it's encouraging because it things are being rolled back and we're starting to get our legs underneath us again and to have some common sense. Also on this, um, this is just from October 4th here, an article that the Epoch Times put out, but it, it it's titled that hospital workers speak out about COVID protocols from coast to coast. So we're finally past all of this like arguing and inflammatory debating where you can't even get your point across. And now the doctors and nurses it explains in this article that they are saying, wait a second, what did we actually do here with our protocols? We missed prescribing various things would have been very helpful for people. A lot of these deaths were unnecessary. Uh, you know, we might recall that Dr. Peter McCullough, one of the great leaders in this whole thing said that 85% of the COVID deaths were unnecessary but people were not following the proper protocols, meaning early on, especially people were put on ventilators. Also, people uh, are, are even to this day getting remdesivir. And that's what these nurses and doctors are crying out about in this article. At least one of the areas is that remdesivir can actually be damaging to people. Potentially, with kidney failure, can you even add to the death toll? And we shouldn't be doing that. And so I'm really, really grateful. But, that but it does make them a lot of money, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. And that is something that... Um, that uh, that is even highlighted in this this Epic Times article. So um, I, I just gotta uh, kind of wrap up this area of COVID encouragements um, in 2022. I've got to wrap up because this is super recent article, but it just makes me smile, Dave. That people still come out with either natural remedies or close to natural remedies. Of course, the mainstream media won't even mention this stuff, but this is too good to pass up. Now, there's many things we've talked about in the past that are would work, but they seem to get um, dismissed um, by, by various uh, um, government leaders and, and others. But anyway, this one literally says, 
rinsing your nasal passages with a saline solution within 24 hours of a COVID-19 diagnosis could reduce your chances of being hospitalized over eightfold. Simple. Yeah, I heard about that, yeah. Yeah, irrigation, you know, you just uh, squirt that water up there and it cleans it out. And I, I mean, okay, this sounds almost fanciful. Like, really, are, are they sure about this? Let me read this. This is actually more substantive than what I thought it was going to be. Dr. Amy Baxter, featured study author and emergency medicine physician at, at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, stated, quote, what we say in the emergency emergency room and surgery is the solution to pollution is dilution. Let me say that again. The solution to pollution is dilution. She goes on to say, if you have a contaminant, the more you flush it out, the better you are able to get rid of dirt, viruses, anything else. One of our thoughts was, if we can rinse out some of the virus within 24 hours of them testing positive, then maybe we can lower the severity of the whole trajectory. And they have evidence that that's what happens. Cheap, inexpensive, easy. You can do this at home easily. Amazing. Yeah, there's a number of, I think, areas in uh, in medicine and treating things where the, a simple solution, which is very Cheap, it can work perfectly fine, but of course, that's not uh, in the interests of those who want to make the profits. Right. Uh, Big Pharma, I believe, has had an un, or I should say a disproportionate sway on this whole thing. And I don't know the specifics, but I just look at this from a Big Pharma perspective. Things here don't look good. They don't. But again, I'm so grateful for those that are speaking out here, more and more people speaking out even this fall, just trying to help right the ship and not to go down. And, and I, I, I'm hopeful in this sense, we don't have to respond to another virus like COVID that comes down in the future. We don't have to respond in the same way. I just hope we can learn our lessons now and remember those lessons. Okay, this is too good too, Dave, just to move on um, before we go to our last segment here. Um, and that is, uh, let's put this up on the screen. We've got a, a couple a couple of memes. And uh, Dave, if you want to take that first one, that'd be great. I like this quote from uh, this British author, Ian Watson. And he said, uh, if you have to be persuaded, reminded, pressured, lied to, incentivized, coerced, bullied, socially shamed, guilt-tripped, threatened, punished, and criminalized, if at all this is considered necessary to gain your compliance, you can be absolutely certain that what is being promoted is not in your best interest. So he was referring to the jab. And this was interesting. You know, when you hear things like this, people often say, oh, that's just a right wing conspiracy theory. Wait, wait a second. This is a British author. I've been to his website. There's nothing there at his website that would even remotely suggest that he's conservative or a Christian, or whatever those typical straw men that are built up and and uh, you know presented, so the whole thought can be dismissed. This guy, he's just saying, "Look at this, people." And so, anyway, I'm just so encouraged that this kind of stuff has been getting out more and more over over the last year. Yeah, there was a a meme I sent out to various friends I liked, and then and uh, it shows first a, a picture of the. GIs storming the beaches at Normandy, and uh, it says, men in 1944 facing almost certain death. And then the next panel shows a man fearfully wearing a mask, uh, you know, a, a, a COVID mask, be hiding behind a chair, and it says, men in 2020 facing a 99.9% .9 survival rate. <laughs> right. It's like, what were we doing, um, you know, in culture at large, but also I would say right within the church, what were we doing responding with the fear, the, the fear that we did? It was just bizarre almost to me, but yeah, point well taken. And again, uh, I think people have turned a corner here. I hope we, if something else comes up, I hope we don't go back into fear, but, uh, but that meme just captures it. Let's uh, be adults here. Let's realize that uh, that we need to step out in faith. We need to do what's right, regardless if some uh, 
potentially scary things are going on. I do want to mention one other thing related to to COVID is just recently I, I did a podcast with Pastor Jackie Hill from Roseville, Minnesota, which is a suburb of St. Paul. But he was the only pastor in that area to keep his church open during COVID. And he uh, really gets into some great stuff related to um, uh, Romans 13, obeying the government, as well as his own personal take on why he felt he needed to be in a posture of willing to lay his life down for the sheep. Really great stuff. And that podcast, if you go to Forerunners of America, uh, the channel, and you look up for podcast 189, um, that's there. And um, and I encourage everybody to look at that. It's it's very encouraging to me, not only as we wrap up 2022, but also um, as we look forward, because probably COVID's not the last time we're going to face something like this. And if not a virus, another reason why um, government They'll or whoever would want to close down the church. I'm sorry, Dave, go ahead. I said, they will come up with something. <laughs> right. You know, so, but but that's a great encouragement listening to Pastor Jackie Hill. Okay, so we've t- touched on some real encouraging stuff related to the tide turning on the LGBTQ narrative, on the abortion narrative, on the um, on the COVID narrative. But there's one last thing I want us to conclude with here, Dave, and that is, is that I think another narrative that's collapsing is also that Christians don't need to do anything. In other words, I think Christians are actually waking up and I think I've seen it more and more this last year, some in 2021, but definitely building stronger in 2022, where as a Christian, you can't just say, well, God is in control and I'm going to do nothing. I'm just going to stay home and watch TV and enjoy my life, blah, blah, blah. But Jesus calls us to be salt and light, as I said earlier, but also we're understanding that that wickedness is going forth in almost every aspect of our society. If we're not careful, wickedness will even take root in our churches, meaning wicked ideologies, wicked beliefs, wicked lifestyles, and that we have to stand up and address things. So I'm super yeah, just like um, just like Wilberforce, who, who knew he had to stand up against slavery. Exactly. And so we're standing up against different things as well today. And let's just give a couple of examples. Um, I just uh, just actually this week uh, saw an article um, that highlighted Moms for Liberty, which is uh, uh, active in many states. And this particular story came out of Berkeley, South Carolina. And what they'd done is they had gone to work and they elected six school board members that were all very helpful in terms of not wanting LGBTQ pushed in the schools, What what's going on here on this issue, as well as critical race theory, which of course, I hope all of our listeners are aware at this point from other podcasts or wherever they're getting their information, that critical race theory is a Marxist ideology. It divides to conquer over the nation. So we can't allow this to be taught in our public schools, or even if you don't use that phrase, it seems like they can still teach the principles of it, which are very damaging. Not going to get into that now. That's beyond our scope here today. But um, these Moms for Liberty in Berkeley, South Carolina, is the fourth largest school district in South Carolina. They put these new school board members on, and the first thing they did is they fired the superintendent of school. They they fired their legal counsel and got better legal counsel hired, and then they formed a. Uh, a committee to look into what exactly are these sexual materials in the library? Are they appropriate for that age group? And we know, again, and we've had this on our podcast as well, we know that there's absolutely pornography and other things that are coming forth. So anyway, um, when you connect with these types of organizations, it's interesting. We're not necessarily talking about a, a uh, a organization with a Christian mandate, but when you get to know them, like I have, um, often many of these people are Christians and they, they're they not necessarily arguing every, everything from the Bible, although they could do that, but they're arguing it more from the basis of science and, and in, in transgender issues, uh, you know, talking about psychologically the damage or abortion, the psychological damage. They argue it for many ways, uh, pragmatic ways, um, uh, science and data and again, psychology, like these things can be dealt with in the public arena where you're not 
only reading Bible verses. Now, I think people know me. I'm all in favor of reading Bible verses, and I want that truth to get out. But sometimes, like in a public school board meeting, those kinds of things, you have to do this in a way that um, that is wise. You have to be prudent in terms of your audience. And not everybody respects the Bible, but still God's truth can still be presented through these different uh, avenues. Yeah, I was I was reading recently that uh, in elections, school boards were, you know, in the past, a non-event, but they now have become a battleground. It's now a, a big political battleground. And that's encouraging because I think it's showing that now conservatives and Christians are are entering that arena and fighting. And so there is a battle going on. Right. And that reminds me of recently we did a podcast called Cultural wars or spiritual wars. And I think that's what we're learning here, Dave. It's very much in line with what you just said, is that I think for a long time in the church, we just dismissed various things as culture wars. And oh, we don't want to get involved in that. But this podcast, it's number, uh, let me see, it's number 181 um, at the Forerunners of America YouTube channel and uh, Spotify as well and Rumble. But here's the thing is, um, is that you can't, any longer have this hiding or passive posture that, oh, those are just culture wars. No, these are actual topics explained in length in the Bible. And if the Bible's speaking on them and telling us what to do, that's that's really God speaking to us. And so to just dismiss this culture wars is no longer uh, a viable option because these are spiritual wars. And, and um, it's very important that we remember at this point of where we're at in the political arena in America, that it's really not Christians being intrusive on the political realm. It's really the political realm has um, crossed the line and come into the church realm, the moral realm. It's Things have really gotten off the rails. And so that we're seeing people rise up uh, is very encouraging. Yes. One other example from this last year that really encouraged me um, that I want to highlight uh, before we wrap up here is that um, in California, so if this can happen in California, meaning uh, Christians make a good uh, step forward, if it can happen in that context, it can happen in your state as well. Um, that's how I look at it. And and in uh, California, in these public schools, they were actually um, teaching them about the Aztecs, you know, in ancient history. And they were having them do Aztec prayers and chants and so forth. And it started to take on this religious feel. Well, anyway, these parents rose up. They got legal counsel. They said, I mean, imagine this, right? Imagine if Christians said, hey, we're going to teach our classroom to go through even something simple like the Lord's Prayer. Like, it's not going to fly. The, the ACLU is going to pounce. There, it's no, But why then are we teaching these kids to do uh, these prayers? And um. Anyway, it, it was a huge victory. Uh, the The judge ruled in favor of the parents, and and I believe that we're f- just now beginning to find our voice um, as Christians, m- much more needed, but starting to find our voice on various issues more broadly, but also as parents, and also for those just with common sense and those that believe in the goodness um, of God and, and the way He created things. It's it's awesome to think that people are starting to take steps. Now, I do want to be clear. This isn't easy. I mean, it's always a a, a risk to step out. So, But people are taking a step of faith. Those that are Christians in this realm are taking steps of faith to say, hey, I can't just sit here and allow my own kids and grandkids to get swept into this kind of evil. And by the way, we care about culture in general. I mean, God's he cares about obviously about our church culture, but God also cares about broader culture. He doesn't want this all to be handed over to wickedness. He wants people to come to faith. He wants people to not be confused on all these issues and so forth. So anyway, pretty, pretty awesome stuff. And, um, and I'm just hoping that we can build on this as in, in the year ahead. Yeah. A lot is at stake because uh, a lot of people tend to get their morality from what's lawful or unlawful. And then you talk about how children are being molded. That's a very important aspect. So let's walk by faith, which really walking in faith includes action, responding in faith in light of all of these areas that are going on in our, our, our nation, our culture, even within our churches, because things are often not addressed in our churches. And therefore, these, these seeds of, of, of doubt, of wickedness, of immorality, they all grow within the church context when we say nothing. Let's uh, let's be a f- full of faith and 
action, they actually go together. I don't think you can separate out action from walking in faith. Faith would imply that that there's action being taken as you walk with God and follow him on these things. And, and, and in closing, and I do, Dave, want to give you a final, final word, but um, I, I do want to highlight here Proverbs 24, verse 11. And it says this, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. And I, when I look at uh, transgenderism being pushed on these kids, their bodies being mutilated, them taking hormone um, injections and all this kind of craziness, they, it, they are being led off to the slaughter. And, you know, it doesn't say like, hey, just with your Christian friends, rescue them from being taken away to death. It's like help people not to head down lifestyles and uh, self-destructive behaviors and ideologies that will actually um, destroy their lives. But if this happens on a broader scale, it will destroy our country. So we want to take action and, and, and go forward. And Dave, um, do you have a final final word as you look at all of this, you know, uh, in terms of, hey, we're really seeing... Um, some narratives collapsing this year. Well, Jesus said, don't put your light under a bushel. And we Christians simply need to be a light and shine uh, the light on these situations and bring out the truth. And I think we, we've we been seeing more of this happening. So that's encouraging. Right. So 2022, many challenges, but also some very specific steps forward that we can build upon. So amen. And I just want to highlight for people, um, I mentioned Timothy Zebel on our Forerunner staff. He's written on a lot of cultural issues. If you go to forerunnersofamerica.com, that's F-O-R-E, forerunnersofamerica.com, and you look at culture and focus, he has talked about these very issues that we're we're talking about today and he has an article forms are articles that are easy to to just shoot the link on to friends and help persuade other people so let's uh let's keep action in in the heart of our faith response and so thank you for being with us here on insights today i look forward to being with you next time <music>